I have this evening with me Sarah Lee, who is the executive director, is that your That's title? Right. Yeah. Of the Governor's Commission on Women, which is a Vermont-based organization that has a legislative agenda and also a social agenda. And we're going to talk a little bit about what's happening in the legislature, which is still going on. And um, you can hardly believe it. <laughs> no, June. It'll be till June, probably. Well, that's what they're saying that it might go till June, and it just—it doesn't seem that it's ever going to be over. You still don't have the sense that, you know, that rushing, rushing around, hasty feeling that you get when it's toward the end and things are wrapping up. I guess because they just have so many big issues that um, they, they bit off an awful lot this, this time to, to deal with. Them. Well, I understand um, that the health care proposal was tabled by the Senate Finance that's Committee right. today. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. that's not a good sign, is it? No. That could very well mean that it's, that it's over or that it's just a temporarily stalled. Yeah, we're, we're not sure yet. Have you been looking at the health care bill from the perspective of women, Governor's um, Commission? Well, yes. What we did was uh, we, the, the commission took policy positions on, uh, on health care and what we felt were important issues for women. Um, we looked at what would be uh, the most important aspect, and, and we thought that for a woman to have access to universal health care, it should be based on ability to pay, because there are an awful lot of women who are in part-time positions, who don't get benefits now, and who are um, out of the employment sphere. So uh, no matter how the, it's financed, whether it's financed through a government program or through insurance payments or one how or another, um, there should be adequate subsidies uh, for uh, low-income people because, you know, for the most part, low-income people are women. And again, as I said, um, workers who are part-time and therefore not um, curr don't currently have benefits. So universal access is an important thing for, for women. So does it make sense to you to have benefits that attach to the individual as opposed to the job that they perform? that everyone has a set of benefits? Well, I think it, it probably would be better to do that. And I believe, and I'm not quite sure about this, but even, um, you know, if you're going to do universal access, I think even if an employer-based uh, insurance premium, they're going to be portable uh, or that there will be some subsidies, government subsidies taking over should you lose your job. Because if you're going to have access, it can't be based on, you know, solely on employment because you would lose that just the way you would right now. Now, you, the Governor's Commission has just come out um, with, not just come out, but this session came mm -hmm. out with a, with a report on the status of women in right. the state. Yes. Can, can you give us a little summary of the findings? Well, sure. Um, actually, uh, what we did was we compared 10 years, uh, uh, the census figures from 10 years ago. Uh, we did a report in 1983, and we looked at women's wages and looked at other uh, factors, and then we did a report in 1993 uh, to compare the 10 years. And what we found is that women made progress of six cents on a dollar. Vermont women we're talking about. In 1979, Vermont women year-round made 60 cents to a man's dollar. In 1989, uh, year round uh, is 66 cents to a dollar. So it's a six year, six cents progress in 10 years is a little bit slow, shall we say. I think we're still looking at uh, a lot of problems for women. And if we also looked at women um, who with uh, and compared um, educational levels uh, with uh, men and with women, and we found that, it's, and this is all Vermont statistics, um, that a Vermont woman um, with a college degree makes less money per hour than a Vermont man with a high school degree. Uh, so, uh, you know, even in where there are, uh, the only areas where women are actually on a, pa on a par would be um, very young, very highly trained women who are still entering, you know, the work pl uh, workplace and have advanced degrees. Those are the only places, and that's just at the starting date that we're talking about, because often, throughout the work experience with women, they get sidetracked to the mommy track or they don't get promoted in the same way that um, men get promoted, even though they're in higher level uh, jobs like engineers or doctors or so forth. Now this is a real obvious question in a way, but why is that? Um, I, well, there's a lot of reasons in my opinion. And um, one reason is because women have often taken care of children and um, they are uh, either not 
considered as um, devoted employees. After all, they can't be here till nine o'clock tonight, you know, and meeting with the rest of them. Or um, they are cycle in and cycle out of employment as opposed to staying in one particular track. For a man, the usual reason why he leaves the job is either he doesn't like the job or he's, or he's been fired. For a woman, she often leaves or a, a job because of family reasons, either obligations, has a child, has to take care of a child, sick parent, or whatever. So with that cycling in and out, um, that is a big disadvantage because you don't accrue that seniority. Um, the other aspects are that women with high school um, di diplomas um, don't have what they call non-traditional training or the kind of training, skills-based training, uh, that many uh, men either get through vocational school or they just do those kinds of jobs where they have um, a, a, a skill and they get paid more for it. Um, even well, However, you, if you were to look at, for example, uh, a secretary versus a janitor in a school setting, um, and try to make a comparison. We know all, most of the janitors are men or maintenance, let's say, versus the secretaries are women. Um, you will find that the maintenance men are making more. And that isn't a function of sen seniority when no. you compare people who've been That's there for right. the same amount of time. No, no. What it is is that, generally speaking, most occupations are sex segregated. There are women's work and there is men's work. And men's work is usually paid more. Now, have you attempted to um, address that on the educational level with younger people, boys and girls, to sort of change what those stereotypes and expectations are? Yes. As a matter of fact, we have a bill that um, is called Gender Equity in Education, um, and the and it has passed the Senate. It got overwhelming support in the Senate, and we were very pleased with a 25 to 5 vote. Mm -hmm. And it actually ha has the the bill as it passed the Senate has an appropriation of 140 thousand. Um, and what it does is it, it requires supervisory unions to look at all their plans, their curriculum, their career development, um, their assessment, and every, every way in which they deal with students to see um, whether they have a problem and ha with gender bias and how they're going to address it. Um, and so we, we think that it's a really far-reaching plan that's it's just saying, you know, um, it's requiring these. And then there's a position at the Department of Ed to person to monitor, to be the equity conscience, so to speak, to infuse equity throughout all these reforms that are um, currently in process in education. Now, some people would argue that that's not the function of government. What would you say in response to that? Well, I think it is the function of government. Government all the time is talking about values that people have, um, is talking about regulating behavior. Um, the function of, of government is, um, as I see it, is to um, figure out fairness. And uh, we legislate fairness all the time in terms of civil rights. I think this is a fairness issue also because I think girls are not getting a fair shake in the school system as it is right now. And so I think it's perfectly appropriate for the government to come in and, and look at this and say, until we have equity, um, there needs to be a special attention. Now, welfare reform was a piece of legislation that passed early in the session and has a lot of implications for women since you said right. most of the people who are poor in this country right. in this state are women. Yes. What's your take on that welfare reform and did you support it? Well, uh, the Commission on Women took a position that said that they would support the work requirement as long as there was education and training and child care. They always say that not one thing cannot be without uh, the others. Uh, and um, I think it's, uh, we're going to be looking as welfare reform and as the, you know, ha as the uh, program develops to be certain that those things are taking place, that people are getting those opportunities. Uh, and I think it's going to be probably something that we're going to be talking about. We do an annual planning meeting. Um, in June, and we look at what the issues are, especially if we've been involved in policy making or um, supporting a legislation, or and and say, all right, is this a process that we need to monitor now? I mean, we're certainly going to be getting the calls at the commission office. Or we get child support calls, we get calls from people who, are on, who are, can't get daycare, people who, uh, and we're going to be getting quite a few calls from women who, you know, uh, may need some help with the system. 
Now, there were a lot of arguments, and I know that Joan Smith, who um, works closely with the Commission in some capacities, made this argument during the welfare reform debate that, um, in effect, you were creating a, a worse situation for women with this legislation. And I believe that the argument was is that there wasn't um, the kind of support. I mean, in other words, it's one thing to have put women in the workforce and to shift them from the welfare system, mm -hmm. but the support that you're talking about just simply isn't there. Well, I think we're going to find that out. I mean, there is a clause in the Welfare Reform Act that says people cannot continue to be en enter in into this particular program. First of all, there are different groups. Not everybody is going to be have their work requirement, but that they're not going to be um, required to do the work uh, unless the support systems are in place. So I think that there, that's what it says in legislation. So I'm hoping that that certainly plays out, and I'm, and I'm sure we'll hear if there's some difficulties like that. What's the Commission's um, position in general on this notion of um, we've created a social welfare system and by geezum we better make those people work because we've been mm. subsidizing them, we're creating cultures of dependence and this just isn't going to wash because we can't get out of this cycle. Do you think that analysis well, holds? I don't know. That there was never a discussion and, and I couldn't you know, say actually what the Commissioners think about this because they're the ones who vote and make the policy. Um, what the whole last year, our commission heard, um, we spent a year, uh, not this past year, but the year before that, listening to all aspects of welfare, people who supported the work requirement, people who didn't, and, um, and we did a paper on looking at both sides of it, and then the commissioners um, made the, the choice that they did. Now, we're going to take a call. Here we go. Hi, good evening. You're on the air. Hi. Hi. Uh, question for uh, um, Ms. Lee. Okay. Isn't really in, a, in effect, I, I'm not really well versed on what the Commission does, but it seems to me it's, it sounds like part of your function is really a state subsidized lobbying group. And I just wanted, you know, your comments as, as to that, and also whether this is something the state ought to be getting into subsidizing individual groups to lobby in effect itself. Okay, very good. Thanks for your question. Um, well, the, uh, there is an executive order that created the commission and part of the job of the commission is to review statutes uh, for discrimination and then to propose legislation that the commission feels is uh, going to further the interests of women and, and improve their status. So I wouldn't call it lobbying. We actually do more than that. We, be, we get task force together. We get people together before the legislative session starts. So, and we say, what are the kinds of problems that we, that we know are out there for women? For, for example, um, harass, not only women, but women or girls. We know that there's a problem in the school for harassment. So what we did was we got it together a task of people and uh, we developed legislation. So it's more than simply monitoring or going down and spending time in the, in the, in the state house. We actually develop the legislation. But it's quite within uh, our uh, uh, mission and how we are set up and what our, we've been around actually for uh, 30 years. It, you know, the Commission on Women was developed in, the, in um, uh, uh, Governor Philip Hoff. And so uh, that's been our mandate. So he did develop that in the early 60s, mm -hmm. which yeah. actually was sort of before women really became a political force. Well, it, it came out as a direct result of the Civil Rights Act. Um, it was that um, uh, President Kennedy uh, formed, uh, that said that there shall be uh, commissions on women. And uh, it was in 1962 or 63, I'm not quite sure, but uh, the whole idea being at this, you know, that realization that women were discriminated against um, that uh, civil rights uh, was going to include not only minorities but women and that there ought to be commissions in every state that would look at the status of women and to help women improve to become more fully involved citizens and participate more and to be more equal in, in their um, activities. 
do you think this commission on women still exists in all the states? Well, it's interesting because sometimes um, those commissions die. You know, we call them, has anyone croaked lately? You know, <laughs> there was a time in, in New England when there, were, there was no commission um, in Massachusetts, for example. Um, they went through a budget crisis and commission, boom, gone. And then we found out just recently that, that um, it has resurrected. Uh, so that there is a commission, and uh, but <clears throat> some states are extremely active. The Connecticut Commission is called the Permanent Commission on the Status of Women, and it's actually um, a legislative creation in in um, Connecticut. So it's not only it only de not only develops legislation, but it's part of the legislature part of the legislature there. Mm -hmm. So uh, being involved in the legislature and doing legislative work is historically a part of all commission activity throughout the country. Okay, I'm going to remind our callers our number is 862-3966. We love hearing from you. If you want to give us a call, we're with Sarah Lee, the Executive Director of the Vermont Commission on Women or the Governor's Commission on Women, which serves the entire state of Vermont. Who are the commissioners? Um, well, the commissioners are appointed by the Governor um, in, in this area. In Chittenden, um, there's Pat Heffernan, um, uh, Sandy Dooley, um, Kate Baldwin, I'm trying to remember all the names, but there are ne uh, several, there are no numbers of uh, commissioners from um, Chittenden County. Representative Ann Pugh is one of them, and um, uh, they are, but we also have them from all different parts of the state. Unfortunately, right now, uh, we have a couple openings, and we really need to have some more down the southern part of the state. Sometimes hard to get people to come up from Bennington, and, um, and yet we really want to have that kind of representation. How many members altogether? At 16 commissioners, and so uh, they are the people who really do the voting of the policy and so forth. And the staff, I'm the executive director, and there are, in our office, um, there are five people uh, currently. And we have, oh, many volunteers. Um, we have older women from the uh, RSVP, Retired Senior Volunteer Program, who come and help out, and uh, we have, uh, uh, we have interns from the law schools uh, who come and help out. So we're always in a hubbub of activity and lots of different people working in the office. In addition to the legislative work, what other activities does the commission perform? Well, a lot of the, the kinds of things, uh, we sponsor events with other organizations. For example, the rally, the Beverly Hines, uh, uh, Wanda, is it Wanda Hines? Rally that was done, um, we sponsored that. Um, we have um, in the past uh, worked with a lot of other organizations. We just did a pamphlet, for example, on family leave where we worked with the Attorney General's office to do that. Um, we, are, we do other uh, publications with other agencies. Um, the, um, we do a, a publications, as I mentioned to you. Uh, we did the Legal Rights of Women a couple of years ago, um, this study on women and economic development. Um, and uh, we attend workshops. We get lots of speaking engagements, um, requests for that. And we do workshops with all kinds of organizations over the state. And we also do um, telephone crisis and hotline. I mean, we get calls all the time. I can't get child support. You know, what am I supposed to do? Or I think I've been discriminated against. I'm just pregnant and I've been fired. You know, is that illegal? Um, those kinds of questions, uh, you know, all day long. So we have staff who rotate and do the, those kinds of crisis and, and intake calls. It, they're, they're constant. And the more we do publications, wh which we do want to do, the more our name gets out there and the more calls we get. We have a question from um, the studio audience, and that is there a governor's commission on men? <laughs> um, well, no, no, there isn't. It's called the legislature. <laughs> Sometimes, well, you know, there's a sort of joke about this. One woman who told me she worked in the library, and one uh, and a fellow came in and said, "Well, here's this women's section here. You know, where's the men's section?" And and she answered him by saying, "The rest of the library." That's right. <laughs> so I think, you know, something to that is is similar. What about? Um, I guess I'm wondering if you see that there are some links between the um, kind of equity issues that you're dealing with with women and the equity issues that low-income people in general have, whether they're men or women? And do you create alliances with other organizations? Oh, yes. Yes. Actually, um, for example, w the minimum wage, um, we've, I worked, we're still hoping that minimum wage might be uh, re resurrected in the Senate. Uh, there's a 
the possibility that it could be tacked on to the workers' uh, comp bill that's uh, presently in the Senate appropriations, although they've threatened that they won't uh, allow that to be. But we have worked really closely with the um, Low Income Advocacy Group and Alan Hark and people who, um, whenever there was a, a lot of testimony with that, we, we worked with that group. And it, part of the whole problem, you know, is that we really don't want to see low income people um, fighting each other. I mean, because some of the problem with that we noticed for the, the with um, the daycare slots is that there are only so many daycare slots, and and sometimes you know w uh, women who are on welfare will get the slots, and then we'll get working women calling us saying, "Well, gee, we can't get slots on there," and it's and it's really hard, you know, for people. And what we say was there should be more daycare slots, and we're always pushing for more, so that it isn't a scramble, you know, with for low income people, but. We work with all kinds of organizations. We've worked with minority business groups. Um, we've worked with uh, women's business groups. We've worked with you name it um, on all kinds of issues. All right. Hi. Good evening. You're, you're on the air. Hello. Hello. Where do you stand on women's issues today? That's a pretty general question. You want to be a little more specific? Well, just a moment, please. Okay. I think we have a call from the living room. You can give us a call at 862-3966. Once again, we're on for another five minutes. Hi. Could you be a little more specific with your question? What about equality rights between men and women? Okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Go ahead, well, sir. Um, when we advocate for uh, equal white rights for women, you know, we're not saying that we're not interested in men. We're in, we think that liberating uh, women also liberates men too. And, um, you know, we we believe that uh, it, it's interesting because we're getting more calls now um, from men than we used to get at the agency. And I got a call just yesterday when I was doing some intake uh, from a man who was having trouble getting child support. He was a custodial parent. And believe me, we worked just as hard for him calling all the agencies and finding out his answer. We're not going to tell him, well, gee, you're a man. I guess we can't <laughs> help you. Um, so we're, and, in, and on family leave, that was an important issue for both men and women, mm -hmm. the, the family leave that we just worked on. And um, men's groups got involved in that, too, because they, at, earlier, it had just been maternity bill, where only women were actually allowed to take the leave. And so a lot of the men's groups were interested in working with the commission to make sure it expanded to family leave. Okay. What are the other issues up um, that you're waiting for pending legislation, or do you have any successes you want to talk about since we have three minutes? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, the Abuse Prevention Act is something that uh, we just got some, uh, we finally got that passed, and that had been four years in the making. And I'd like to just publicly say thank you to Representative Sally Fox, who's the chairwoman of the House Judiciary Committee, because she worked on this bill for four years and never gave up, and we finally got it to the Senate. It means child support payments for women who are, have to get temporary restraining orders, and it also means uh, privilege, uh, executive privilege, or evidentiary privilege is what it's called for crisis workers. So that if you go to a ripe crisis center and you tell people your story, that per crisis worker now will not have to be called to a witness stand and, and have to talk against you, which is what had happened. They're going to get the same kind of privilege that a, a counselor or a, or a therapist or someone would have. Okay, let's just take, we have a call in line too. Hi, good evening. Yes, I just have a question for you. Quickly, yep. Yeah. Now, regarding the minimum wage, uh, when it was uh, voted, on, uh, voted on recently, uh, who, for the, who had a deciding vote as to uh, whether it would pass or not? Okay. Well, I, I don't know if I could say a deciding vote, but um, okay. I know that in the Senate uh, there was only one Republican that sided with the Democrats in order to get um, the bill uh, passed, and it, it wasn't enough. So there was a tie, and then Barbara Snelling uh, broke the tie. So that's the scenario of what happened in the Senate. Right, and this is what kind of made me lose support for Barbara Snelling, because I believe that the minimum wage is way below. Oh, I agree with you. I mean, uh, it's even kind of ludicrous in a way to talk about a, a 25 uh, cent increase. Um, people can't live on this. No, and, but it was surprising is, is that when it comes time for their wages to be increased, <laughs> they have no problem to do this. But for 25 cents for the working poor, really, is a very is a, a disgraceful thing. I, 
I was extremely disappointed. I have to tell you that. Thank you very much. Thanks right. very much. What about the arguments of small business people who simply can't afford to pay more to their workers? Well, you know, I mean, I I think it. On the one hand, most of them say that they don't. They pay more than minimum wage. So if they pay more than minimum wage, how how much could they really be affected? I think it was more that they were concerned that it would set a precedence of mandating to businesses, and they uh, generally just don't like any mandates. Okay. We have one question. Um, we, we actually have a little bit more time. We have five more minutes than we thought oh. we did, so that's good. Our number is 862-3966. I want to ask you a little bit more about the legislation, but we do have a question from the, the um, audience out there in cyberspace. What do you do in your position? So oh. you're the executive director, <laughs> obviously, well, but... I run the office, basically, for the commission. Uh, I run the office. Um, I make sure that, you know, I supervise the staff. I testify over at the legislature. I'm the spokesperson for the agency. Um, I do workshops when people, you know, want people to talk. I talk to the media <laughs> and, you know, try whenever to get the word out about what we do. So those, and I also have to, uh, take care of the budget, make sure that we get enough office supplies and, and that we're not, you know, spending over our, our means, which it isn't very much. What's your budget? Um, well, uh, most of the money, 75% of the money that we get goes directly out to grants of, uh, to the domestic violence and sexual assault programs. So the commission has all together for the five people and the staff and everything, it's about 150000 And then um, there's about 600 uh, thousand that goes out in state and federal funds directly to the programs. And another thing that we do, which I should have mentioned, is we administer that. We have a, a grants administrator um, who uh, works with programs and gives them technical assistance too. What other legislation are you keeping your eye on before the endless session is over? <laughs> well, actually, um, those two things that I mentioned, the, the minimum wage and the gender equity in education, um, uh, we're hoping certainly that um, house education will uh, will go along with the Senate version, although we understand it's going to be very much scaled back, and so we're disappointed about that. Um, we're happy about the Abuse Prevention Act, and we're happy about the harassment and education bill that passed. It's going to require, it's going to extend harassment protections to students. I don't know if people are familiar, but there was a sex, harass a sex harassment in the workplace bill that was passed last year that the commission supported and generated. And now we wanted to extend those same protections to students and include um, the broader categories of sexual orientation, race, and um, the other uh, kinds of discriminated uh, classes. Now, the commission is gonna get together in June to set the priorities for the next year and the next session. Mm -hmm. what, are you, what is emerging as some is issues that are important? Well, I think what we're gonna do is we're gonna go back and say, okay, now we've done this women in economic development. We've looked at all the problems of, uh, you know, the, of the gender pay gap. What are we gonna do about it? I think we're gonna devote our whole time for our annual meeting on, are, is there any way in which we can try to get at this problem? I should also add that there is an affirmative action um, council that the commission's involved in that's going to look at state government and, the, and women's positions in state government. But I know that there's some uh, national legislation that's called Pay Equity Act or something like that. And I don't know whether we're going to try to do that, but I think we've got to try to figure out some ways to get at the basic economic problems with women. Okay. Sir, I want to thank you very much for being with us. Oh, Great thank to you. have you. Obviously <laughs> not enough time, but thanks well, for being I've on. Well, I've enjoyed it. I appreciate it. And thanks for watching. And, uh,